We are here for our Monday Mindset, and right now we're in the middle of a motivation series. The reason why we call it Motivation Hacks is that we want to make it really easy for you to, you know, tap into things that help your kids series. Oops. The reason why we call it Motivation Hacks is that we want to make it really easy for you to, you know, tap into things that help your kids series. Oops, right here. The reason why we call it Motivation um, things that really uh, help your kids tap into what we in um, educational theory and psychological theory we talk about in child development called intrinsic motivation. So intrinsic motivation is where the motivation comes from within rather than from the external external forces. So in other words, a child sees a mess and goes, oh, I should probably clean that up. And then they think, Hmm, well, last time that took a really long time. I wonder if I just break it down into steps, if that'll go faster. And then they do the first thing, like I'll pick up my laundry first and then I'll bring the dirty dishes to the sink. <laughs> and then why don't I check the floor and see if anything's left on the floor? Um, and lastly, I'm gonna make my bed. Now, I I'm probably painting a bit of a dream scenario for some folks who are going like, Vanessa, my kid's three, they're not there yet. And that's totally fine. Um, however, the, the possibility of getting there is what keeps uh, us motivated to do things, sometimes hard things like lean into new strategies and try them out or make some time in your day like you are today to come to a talk. So first of all, I just wanna congratulate you for being here and how many of you would like a piece of that, right? Of your child having some internal motivation and even organization around how to do some daily things. Um, sometimes it's not just daily things though, we also are thinking about as we're heading back to school, how many of you I wonder are already in there. I know several families in my life and my clients are, kids have already been back in school for you know over a week. Um, others are waiting till after Labor Day. So you might be right in the middle somewhere. Um, how many of you would like your child to have more intrinsic motivation, meaning coming from within for their schoolwork and their learning or for bringing their work home in an organized way so that they can get started right away when they get home for completing assignments, for um, maybe even doing something, you know, a little extra credit if, they're, if the opportunity arises for those of you who have older, older children who are um, you know, being offered that as part of their grading system. Well, I'm here to lend you my expertise. The good news is that I have spent you know, two decades now of my, my life and my career really committed to this question of how do we motivate children from within? And sometimes it starts with introducing things outside, but of them, things sometimes we even need to have, like you know, consequences, rewards, incentives, and things like that to get the ball rolling. But always, 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 we're keeping, we don't really wanna set up a system that is only based on what you get for what you do, yeah. How many of you had a kid say, well, yeah, I'll, I'll help you with that chore, but what do I get for that? Or what are you gonna give me if I do it? Or, <laughs> If this is sounding familiar, please let me know in the chat so I know that these, you know, the folks I've been talking to aren't alone. And you can see that you also aren't alone because it happens. Yeah, I've got a yes here on Zoom with Joan. Thank you for letting me know. Tuning in from Sausalito with your 12 year old, with your 12 year old grandson. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So uh, this series, we've, I'll just do a quick review. We've been going through the eye care model, which comes from, you know, my, tens of thousands of interactions with students and with the kids in my life. Um, and then adding into that the research, the proven motivation methods, and then putting it to the test, you know, in the classroom with 24, 36, sometimes 48 kids, and really seeing like, I, I get to find out really quickly if my motivation strategies are working or not, because it's multiplied. And those of you with multiple kids know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I have a client with four children, for example, and they, they notice really quickly whether their motivation strategy is working because it's times four. Yeah. Yeah. So the I care model is an acronym that stands for interest, competence, autonomy, relatedness, and effort. If you wanted to write that down, you could. Um, the reason why it's in this like five, five pieces sort of motivation hack system is because we can run a situation through the five motivation hacks and one of them will almost always work. You can like, if you can find the one that can shift things over to feeling more motivated, then it almost always works to boost motivation and it'll be different things for different times. So sometimes chores will go more smoothly. If for example, 
if you make them more interesting, you find out why they matter, you um, maybe even add in some fun and some play that can make it more interesting. You can um, listen to a podcast about something you're interested in to kind of keep your mind occupied and, and getting something else out of it besides this mundane thing. So you, sometimes it's interest. Other times, the reason why chores sort of stall out is there's a lack of competence or skill, and that's the C in the eye care model. Perhaps we need to take some time out for training, as Jane Nelson would say, a positive discipline. Take some time out for training to actually show them how, how to do this, you know, this task and maybe break it down into smaller steps, identifying which ones they can do on their own and which ones they really need our help with or have yet to learn. Sometimes even the breaking it down to steps itself is part of competence because how many of you have seen a child look at something, you know, be sort of daunted and walk away? Like it could even be a social situation. They don't know quite how to like, who to walk up to and say hello to, so they cling to your leg instead. But if you help them walk up to one person and say hello or one activity they like and say hello and sort of break it down into smaller steps, it just helps them to organize how to even join the scene in front of them. But we can do the same with things like homework, things like, um, you know, being like stages of being kinder and kinder to your siblings even. Um, I've had a parent go from don't scream at your, your or a, a child screaming and hitting their, their sister and pulling their hair to trying to get them to go straight to being nice. And it was like too many steps that were skipped. And when, when she realized she was doing that, she's like, oh, first I need to add, help her just, you know, regulate her emotion and get that lid back on, which we'll talk about in, a, in, in the meltdowns webinar coming up in October. Um, so yeah, and she needs to first learn how to get her lid back on and calm down. And then next, how to walk away instead of doing harm. So kind of a do no harm sort of step. Um, and then maybe how to say the words without using her hands, but maybe she's still screaming a little bit and then learning how to use a calmer, calmer voice. And then maybe figuring out what it is that she really needs from her sister. Like, please stop touching my stuff. I asked you already to stop. I need you to stop. And, you know, and now we're, now we're getting towards being nicer. <laughs> so competence, breaking things into steps is C. A for autonomy is the one we worked on last week. So by the way, these videos are in the Facebook group. If you go back to the last two announcements, last two or three, within the last two or three announcements and videos, or to hit, hit the videos button, you'll see the um, part one, part two. So we're, we went over interest and competence in part one. And then part two is all about A for autonomy. Oh, Peter, I wonder what Pete, which Peter is here. Say hello, if you would, in the chat. Um, so I know which one. <laughs> and if this is your first time on, welcome. Let me know where you're tuning in from. This is for folks on Facebook too. We have three listeners who haven't yet commented. Go ahead, like Joan did here on Zoom. Let me know what city you're, you're, you're residing in, the ages of the children in your life, and one thing you would love your child, children, or the children in your care to be more motivated to do on their own. So I can speak to that in this, maybe even use yours as an example. So moving on from A, I is interest, C is competence, A is from is autonomy. Oh, hey, P okay, so Peter, Peter's here. Peter B, hi. <laughs> One of my clients, uh, we were actually talking about having four children and I was re referring to your household <laughs> and how you get to know, you can see right away whether your motivation is working because it's times four. And I was explaining how when I'm in the classroom or if I'm in a group of children or if I have several clients trying the same strategy at the same time, we can kind of get times 10, is this working or not? We get feedback really quickly. So I'm kind of sh you know sharing that with you who may not have the benefit of four children or two or, or more than that. Okay, so back to the model. I for interest, C for competence, A for autonomy was last time. Autonomy is all about um, making sure that children feel like they have enough control, influence, um, or power in a situation. And sometimes we can err on the side of either taking away all their power or giving them complete power. And we forget about the in-between. But then we can also turn the in-between into this constant negotiation of like give and take and give and take. And what I can offer you is a tool of just offering choices. And, you know, Peter, we talked about this this month a lot in the setting limits module of the year long immersion, right? Because we were talking about well, what, what happens when you've set a limit, you've gotten really clear about it, and then you're in that moment, that's limit setting moment, and they don't follow, they don't follow the limit. 
oftentimes we kind of hand it back to them by giving them two choices. And one of those choices may or may, may involve some kind of logical consequence. Like um, if you're not able to come to the table, then that means you're probably gonna need to eat during the time when we're all watching the movie. And so I, you know, it's up to you. If you wanna miss part of the movie and eat later, you can, but you know, what, what I would love to see is you to come to the table and eat with us. It's really your, your choice though. I'm thinking of a 10 to 11 year old. <laughs> um, and, and just sort of like, the, or, or you could do a modified choice giving, which like, it'd be, it's okay this time, but we're gonna need to talk about this. If you choose to leave, you know, choose not to come to dinner, we're gonna need to talk about this and, get, and figure out what's going on here so that you can join dinner tomorrow. Sometimes you don't have the capacity for the battle. But you see, there's still choices. You're still offering cho some kind of autonomy. So it's not just like either total compliance or total freedom, something in between that does build in some of that autonomy. Another way to build an autonomy is to gather their input and have them have a sense that they co-created whatever it is, whether it's a, a limit, a routine, an event, um, you know, a plan of some kind, some, and you, you kind of help them figure out what their role is. What is their contribution? Like someone really young could help you pick out a paint chip for their, their room, for example, but you narrow it down to three choices. Um, there's so many ways to build in choice um, with you know boosting this this piece of autonomy and the research shows that without autonomy there's very little intrinsic motivation and it's right in the heart of the model i c a r e the a because it's sort of it's one of those things that unlocks unlocks uh, intrinsic motivation so today we're talking about our relatedness and the reason we're doing relatedness as you know some people are like i still don't quite understand what that means it's it's really about relationships, but relatedness it also captures like how is this related to something bigger? How many of you have felt like your boss or someone an authority figure in your life has asked you to do something, and because it doesn't really seem related to anything, you don't really feel invested in doing it. Like it's not the thing that you're going you know going to put at the top of your list. You might even ignore the request until more information is offered. Um, or, you know, you just sort of put on, pump the brakes instead of pumping the gas. It could be that you don't have a context for it, like how is this related to our greater goal, or how is this related to the team's mission, or how is this related to me? Um, so that could be one aspect of relatedness too. So it's like not just interpersonal relationships. But let's focus on the relationships now that you have a little sense of that. What can happen for a lot of kids, especially in times of COVID where they've been sending, spending all this time sheltering in place, or now they're suddenly amongst tons of kids and they're trying to navigate all those relationships, is that we often need to reestablish our connection with our kids before we start asking them for things or giving them corrective feedback. So more than ever, it's important for us to do this thing. Again, another Jane Nelson positive discipline concept that I've seen work so well, especially for parents, busy parents, which is the connect before you correct, yeah. And so you're really harnessing the power of connection. And so it could look like this, you know, you see that your child has not yet brought their lunchbox to the, to the kitchen and that's something that they know they need to do, but they're obviously not remembering. And you're feeling a little irritated that you need to remind them again. Like this is like the 300th day of school and you know, over the last two years or three years, I guess it would be like three years <laughs> that you've had to say something and it's, you know, kind of irritating. <laughs> What you could do is go, you could just be like, oh, could you put your lunchbox in the kitchen? You know you need to do that as soon as you get home, right? And that, 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 could, that could work. They could be like, oh yeah, I forgot. But that kind of wears everybody down over time and can kind of like, mm, you know, kind of stretch that relationship kind of thin because then when you come into their space, they're like, oh, what are you going to remind me to do now? Or what have I done wrong? Or, you know, they might cringe a little. Um, and so one thing you might consider is just connecting with them for like 10 seconds even before you do say something that might be considered like a pointing out that they, you know, a correction because you're pointing out something they forgot or you're, you know, um, criticizing them in some way. They might take it that way. This is especially important for, uh, important for kids that get into, you get into power struggles with a lot or um, tend to internalize a lot of like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. They just like say sorry so, so often. They're going to especially need some reassurance that, you know, you're just, you're just playing your side of the role of like you, you're older, you have more life experience, you're paying more attention. Maybe your, your personality is just more detail oriented than they are, 
but I guarantee you that your prefrontal cortex is more developed than your children's because you've been on the planet for more years. It can take until you're 28 until your prefrontal cortex is, has its like basic executive functioning all the way developed. And you can keep going from there. You can build from there and get even more and more adept as time goes on. But you, know, you have to have some compassion for our kids and their limited life experience or limited ability to focus or limited ability to like hold many things in their mind at once, which is like working memory, all these different functionings. Um, so connecting before correcting, just dropping in, sitting next to them, asking them what they're looking at, what they're doing. You know, I always say like, if you come at them like this, then you're giving them something to push back on. But if you come up to them, sit down next to them and actually look at what they're looking at. And then from the sort of like side by side sort of position, you know, of like companionship, you say, hey, I noticed that you didn't put your lunchbox away. Do you think you could take care of that? It feels really differently than, hey, how come you haven't put your lunchbox away? Um, so just something to consider around relatedness is the power of connection. Now, there are a few other strategies I'm going to go over, but before I do, I do want to hear from you, like in the comments or in the chat. If you could just give me one little line, one little sentence, give me some insight into something, it is, something that you would love your child to be more motivated to do. And let's see if we can't connect that to this strategy, that these, this, this, either the interest, competence, autonomy, or the relatedness strategies. Because what, what ends up happening is we end up being able to sort of have a diagnostic and we can practice that together right now. Okay. And this diagnostic is sort of like, we're diagnosing like what, what could be getting in the way of motivation here and what do we need? Like, what, what should we try next? Because awareness of the strategies is one thing. And that's why you come to trainings like this and congratulations for making that time. Yeah. Really good job. And like, how do we apply them? Yeah. So I gave, I'm giving examples along the way, which are going to help. But I mean, if you come to me with your specific, you know, challenge, it could be a chore, a specific chore, a specific part of day. It could be even around a behavior that you want them to be more motivated to do, like a new habit you want them to establish or an old habit you want to break, kind of paired together. It could be around schoolwork. It could be around, you know, routines, getting them out the door. Yeah, okay, good. So we've got one, one person so far. Yeah, keep them coming, okay? So, so far, Peter has shared that the daily reminder for chores is something that he would really like the kids to be more motivated, that instead of having to do daily reminders, there's something that kind of brings it up for them, right? So they're more intrinsically motivated. So first of all, in order to establish a daily habit, it can take up to 10 weeks. So <laughs> that's not to say that it's going to look the same throughout the whole 10 weeks okay that it's going to be this like robotic thing you have to do and then it's and then it suddenly clicks at the end of 10 weeks it's more of that scaffolding yeah so where you start out and peter i'm just going to go for it because you're my client and you've 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 now had a lot of these conversations you know you've heard a lot of this information and you guys well everyone else who's listening friends um can kind of sound hear what it sounds like when i coach my clients who've been with me for now over a year, yeah, Peter and his lovely wife, Elizabeth. Um, so first of all, I would, I would be checking out each of your kids and thinking, what, what, would they, what, would they, what would it take for them to be the most motivated to at least kick things off? So it is sort of like your low hanging fruit. So like for your little one, it might be about singing a song and making it a game, you know, and just sort of like, woo, and like showing that enthusiasm, yeah. Um, giving her an important little job, like she gets to move, move the little, you know, or like check off the little boxes when things are done, like something that she can absolutely do that's super easy for her. Um, so that, that could be something I would try with your littlest one. Now your middle kids, <laughs> they're a similar age, you know, in similar stage, I would say your older child, right, Peter, is now in more of like early middle childhood, uh, heading into like, you know, it's a pre-teenager now. Um, for your middle kids, I would say it's more about like geeking out on the plan and getting them involved in like, you know, creating the chart and being uh, maybe in charge of, you know, tracking it across the week instead of, you know, and maybe in charge of helping Lucy read the words for where she can, your little one for, for checking off the boxes as you, as they go. Um, I also, the autonomy is going to be really important. So 
I would build in at the, at the beginning of the week, like we've talked about before, a way for them to choose which ones they're gonna do that week. And then they stick with it for the, for the week. So you're not necessarily having them choose every single day because that in itself can be a whole back and forth thing. But um, you know, setting up one of the charts where you know you have each child's name, and then you have a list of what the chores are, and then they can either like write them in or move them over some way to like assign them. Um, I've also seen uh, what I've done in the classroom is I'll have like a, a laminated piece of cardstock with all of the words, or, or it doesn't even have to be laminated with all the chores on it that are about as thick as a as a um, clothespin, and then I'll just put the kids' names on the clothespins, like they each have three, let's say, and then they move those clips around to like clip onto three of them that they're gonna be in charge of that week. And that way, what needs to get done stays static, but who does them changes. That's another way you could set that up that we haven't really chatted about. Okay, so they rotate weekly, great. Now, who's in charge of how they rotate and making sure that that's written down. I just wonder about guiding them in that process, but having them do some of that work, especially in middle childhood kids. I mean, your um, middle kids who are kind of in elementary age, they really like, they're like, it's the age of industry. So they really like um, doing the thing, like writing it, you know, or, and they, their, their personalities, you know, also weigh in here, maybe one more than the other, but they can tend to be more interested in the constructing part. So I wonder about giving them some kind of task like that. Now for your older child, you know, this might be about, you know, help having, having him sort of get on with it so he can go have time with his peers. I know he's really interested, for example, in spending time with the kids in the neighborhood. And maybe this is more of like a ticket item for him to have access to that totally autonomous time away from the home. Um, what happens with pre-teenagers is they tend to really want to be away from the, the family unit with their peers more and more. And it just is something that will compel him. So it's more like around relatedness in terms of, you know, if I take care of my household, like if I do my household things, <laughs> then I get to go have this time where I relate to my peers. So it's, it's, a, it's a little bit more of like a reward sounding thing, but it's more like, I think of it as a ticket, like an exit ticket. Like you can absolutely exit the building once you've finished your chores and had, had an adult come and check them that they're done. Um, and then eventually he will come to you and say, I did this, this, and this, can I go now without you having to ask him to do it for, before he leaves? Um, if he doesn't have a thing to go to and it's just, it's like, part of the daily routine. There's no thing to look forward to. Another thing you can talk to him about is, um, you know, like seeing it, see if he can rise up to that modeling status where he's the older child. So what, what can he teach his younger siblings and that, or, or help them with like helping the littlest one, you know, reach the cabinet to get the supplies out or something along those lines that he might rise to the occasion in that sense or helping the little one like read the chart or find, you know, find the things like we mentioned. Um, so that's more in, that's also in relatedness. Um, and I think really uh, re like catching him being good is gonna be huge because I know that there's a lot of, there's like some variable self-esteem there with your eldest, Peter. And um, even if he's not, comp if he's not doing it perfectly every time, I wouldn't harp on him. Like I would say like, wow, okay, so you got started without any, anybody reminding you. Dude, that's great, you know, or sweetie, whatever, however you refer to him. That's great. I'm so glad that you were, took that initiative. That really just shows me like how mature you're getting. Like whether they respond well to it or not, like if you, they might not go like get puffed up and go, yeah, I did right away. But over time, if you, it's amazing how much preteens, respond to compliments. They just so badly wanna be seen in a good light, even when they're acting worse than their siblings. It's just so hard, it's like a hard balance. So <laughs> you have to just kind of like acknowledge any little inch that he gives, be like, act as if it were, a, you know, a yard. And then, and, and see where that takes you, you know, because I think the momentum that can build from that is, is that he, when you walk up to him, he's like happy you're, you're there say, saying something about chores rather than like rolling his eyes at you already. Yeah, um, I did this with my 10 year old all the way through when he was a freshman in college or sorry, freshman in high school where I just had to catch him being good all the time. 
like he would do three things wrong, but I would just point out the fourth thing that he did right. You know, I was like, oh, thank you so much for remembering. Like, I'm so glad you remember to wash your hands when you left the bathroom, hun. I know that's something you've been working on. It helps us all stay healthier when we all wash our hands. That's so great. Awesome. And then I just let that sit. I don't go, but, you know, just let it sit. And another time I was like, hey, what do you want to do right now? And then we go and do something else or whatever. And I said, oh, wait, you know, hey, you know, I noticed that you might want to go check the bathroom because you might have forgotten something. Like, see how I'm just softening it. I'm not like, but you forgot to put the toilet seat down and wipe the seat and you know, like all the other things you forgot. And you dropped, you left the, the towel on the floor, right? Like I could have gone in there and be like, why is this such a mess? Like, or go back and clean up that mess. Like there's all these ways that I could have just gone, like really taken a self, like not even a self-esteem, but like our relationship and like, you know, sort of eroded it and deflated it. But instead I just kind of, you have to kind of uh, protect their fragile ego a little bit and let them see, and, and it trains you to see what they are remembering and what they are doing well, rather than only focusing on what they're doing wrong. And if you train yourself to do that, then they can do that too. And it helps them sort of build from a positive place of like, oh, I already, I got one thing done. Now I only have three things left instead of like, oh, why is my dad making me do all this? It's so unfair. No one else has to do this. You know, my, my little sister doesn't have to. It's like, yeah, well, she's, you know, she's not even a kindergartner yet <laughs> like give her give her a break but they don't want to hear it yeah so i'm just kind of riffing here um peter likes going to work on catching the positives and addressing them good idea okay i'm glad you like that one and it really is that connecting before correcting but it's a little i narrowed it down a little more specifically for your particular child who's also a, their particular age <laughs> yeah um joan says is that she's using various ideas that i spoke about and oh, there's a con the constant is wanting to negotiating everything he's asked to do. Okay. All right. So Joan, that is partly up to you too. And I'll tell you why. And this is something we just talked about in the immersion. And I, I can only give you the short version because we had a two hour training about this, right? Um, which if you want to hear more about, let me know, Joan. Okay. It's something that you're like, ooh, I didn't know there was an immersion, like a module on setting limits. Exciting. <laughs> let me know. Um, you can just message me, okay? You click on my name and you just uh, send a little message. But one thing we talked about is that if we don't have at least some clarity about what's negotiable and what's non-negotiable, heading into a time with kids, especially if there's been like recurring things that like, like you're saying it's constant. When I hear the word constant, I go, hmm, it's time for the adults to take a little inventory about like what is negotiable and what's non-negotiable. And once you do that and get clear, and there's a whole method I have on getting clear about that and, and like sort of putting things into zones of like never, sometimes, and always, like they can never do this, they can sometimes do this, and they all, we always love when they do this other thing into zones. Once you get really clear about that, which is a great process, I can walk you through Joan if you'd like, you can get to a place where you can then share that with the kids. In this case, your 12 year old, in a way that they can hear. Because if you talk about it too much on a meta level of like, I don't like how you're constantly negotiating things. Not everything in life is a negotiation. Some things in life you just have to listen to. Great, great, true story, right? Good life lesson. But if you open the conversation there, you're likely to shut them down. I don't know if you've tried that, Joan, and seen the difference, seen what happens. Um, occasionally they'll lean into that, but generally not. And here's why. What I've seen is that kids, especially he's also a preteen, you know, on the cusp of becoming a teenager, is that they don't like when you speak in these generalities and sort of do this like blanket judgment of them. They just, they just can't stand it. Like I remember being called sensitive anytime I had any kind of emotional reaction to something that I didn't like or I didn't agree with. Oh, you're just being sensitive. <laughs> And it was the worst, you know, because because I'm like, now I can be like, yeah, and I love that about me. But it took a long time <laughs> to sort of embrace that part of me because it was this sort of like character judgment or this, you know, because negotiate the power of like, being able to negotiate when it's appropriate, such a powerful skill. Like you don't, you don't actually dislike that your 12 year old can negotiate things. Like that's actually something you like in the end of the day that you don't want to squash. And you don't want to judge necessarily to the point where it seems like it's a bad quality. But what you do want him to learn, and let's get clear, I can help you with just this little piece, Joan, right here, mm -hmm, is that you want him to get, get um, a very clear sense of when it's appropriate to 
negotiate and when it's appropriate to, to like fulfill your role or to hold up your end of an agreement or to do your part, right? Where it's not, life is not a constant negotiation, even though it's a great skill to have. Um, compromise, um, generosity, uh, sensing the needs of others, um, having a personal sense of responsibility, having a sense of responsibility to your, to your community. These are things we also want, not just the ability to negotiate. So, yeah. <laughs> so let's get you clear on what's negotiable and non-negotiable, take you through that process, Joan, and I recommend this to everybody, especially if you're having these moments where either there's constant negotiation, constant pushback, you know, constant sort of doing it, but doing it begrudgingly, lots of complaining and whining and feet dragging, you know, those things are happening. We need to get you clear. That's like step one. Let's get you clear on like what's negotiable, what's non-negotiable. Um, and then and then we can introduce it to the ch children or the teen or preteen in a way that they can hear, in a way that actually is interesting, that helps them build skills. So I'm going through with competence with it, that gives them some choices and gathers their input, gets their insight, helps them have a sense of their, their responsibility in making it go smoothly. Um, and then build your relationship rather than breaking it down. Yeah. So we just went through ICAR of <laughs> the model. Yeah. Yeah. And we can weave all those things in there. Yeah. So, um, so, but I think step one is getting clear. Yeah. Getting clear on the negotiable, non-negotiable Joan. That, that would be my, my, my key insight for you today to walk away with. She says, <laughs> he says, oh my gosh, he says, yes, correct. That would be great. He wants to be a lawyer. How fitting. And Joan says, okay, thank you. Yeah, and Joan, I'll drop a link in here too where you can you can even look at like things a little more globally and do a little assessment of like what might be going on. I just dropped a little link to a quiz you can take. It takes five minutes. Anybody else who wants to also. Jessica's here. Hey, Jessica. So glad you're here. Oh, and Jessica, yes, we are definitely, she says she's interested in all the modules after our coaching. Jessica, you're going to be so well set up for joining the immersion after we're done with your you're intensive, totally. Yeah, yep. And you've got your 15-year-old and your four-year-old. That's right, from Illinois, from Tornado Country. Jessica, I hope every I hope the storms have been mild enough this last month. We haven't really talked about that recently. She's one of my smart clients as well. And then Kayla. Oh, hey, Kayla. Um, Kayla's here from Florida with her kid and her boyfriend's three kids. So she's got nine, eight, eight, and five. Oh yeah. So Kayla, you're going to really want to think about some of the things I shared with Peter about his middle, his middle childhood kids, not middle childhood, sorry, this middle, middle siblings. Um, his ages eight, eight, and nine, I've spent a lot of time with 10 years in the classroom with six to nine year olds. I inherited my stepson when he was 10. So this, that, that little age range right there, I know very well. And, um, one of the things I, I want to point out is that around age seven is when kids have the neurological, bio, like the biological ability to fully take on the perspective of someone else. And that's just the peak of the bell curve. So some people, in other words, like on average, it happens at seven, but some kids it happens earlier, some kids it happens later. And so you're going to really be wanting to watch out at eight, eight, and nine, <laughs> those three. And also, you know, all of you who have kids in that eight, kind of seven to like even six and a half to like nine range, watch for the shift. One of the things they'll be able to do is um, even like start to have empathy for causes out in the world, like animal welfare, the homeless, you know, homeless population struggles, you know, whether if there's some kind of... Um, conflict that's happening in the world to start to take interest in that. That's something you can look for as a sign. Um, you can also, you also will get pot potentially like maybe only once, but you'll see it break through like a truly sincere apology where you like, when they feel bad, they actually are feeling it. Like they're like, oh, I get it. You can just see the light bulb go off. And the reason I bring that up when it relates to motivation is that and relatedness is that one of the most important things that can come in that sort of transition developmentally that happens around seven and eight um, is that kids will start to realize who's going to be impacted when they either do a thing or don't do a thing and it doesn't always just come spontaneously however 
it, they do have that ability so we can start to nurture that and ex even expect it. Now, every kid is different. So not everybody has the same range of, of, of ability to empathize, not every human does. And so you're gonna wanna get to know your child's sort of ability there as well, that's a factor. But what you can start to do is ask questions like, who will be impacted if I do this and if I don't? And just doing it almost as like a thought experiment of like, okay, so, so you're saying <laughs> that it doesn't matter whether or not we take out the garbage. Okay, yeah, well, let's, let's test that theory out. Yeah, so like, what, what, first of all, what happens when, when the garbage doesn't get taken out? Well, it just stays here. Okay, and then what happens? And you kind of like walk it through to its, to its sort of conclusion, right? You're like, okay, so then after three weeks, we've got all this stinky, rotting stuff in the house. Who's that gonna impact? <laughs> what might happen, right? Oh yeah, so rats and mice might come and ants and you know, it's gonna be stinky at home. And like, especially if it's hot, like, especially if we have to sort of shelter in place or are stuck and have to do things at home, we're gonna be in this smelly place. It's gonna be a real, real bummer. I'm gonna be impacted. Oh, and even our friends might not wanna come over. Like you might invite someone to come over and then they're like, no thanks. <laughs> Cause we're like, we have the stinky house, you know? And if you help them just sort of imagine it forward and to who will be impacted if they do the thing and if they don't. Cause then you can also walk through the positive scenarios. Like, okay, but if we do take out the trash, what happens? Oh, we get to have a household that doesn't smell bad. And what, what happens? Well, it's kind of pleasant to be in the space. It might even smell good if we like bring in some flowers or spray some, you know, some essential oils or something. Okay, nice. Um, and then when our friends come over, they're like, oh, I feel safe and healthy here. I want to come back you know, <laughs> and spend more time at this house, right? And, and you can kind of play it through in a way that you can't when they're littler the same way. Like they just won't connect. They won't be able to answer those questions and think that through with you as much. And notice how it's just sort of like, then you turn it back to them and say, okay, so what do you think is the right thing to do here around taking the trash out? And they might go, okay, I get why we got to take it out. It's just, that I don't like touching the dirty bags. And then you get to actually problem solve and say, oh, so it's not really about just, it's not just about not wanting to do it. I hear you. So then you can get into what could we do so that we don't have to touch it, like wear gloves or ask for help or, you know, double bag it or whatever needs to happen. Or we all need to be more careful about getting the stuff in the bag so the outside of the bag is not so bad to touch or whatever it is. Maybe it's a new trash can, new trash can location. But then you get to be in this same team kind of feeling. And that is the core to me of a positive connection is when you get to a problem and instead of feeling like enemies, you feel like a team that's side by side working towards you know, the goal because you get why it matters and you care enough. That's why it's the I care model to <laughs> care enough to pursue pursue a solution together um, and or navigate a loss together or you know deal with the coping with this back to school situation that is so variable Every, everywhere is different right now we're having such a variety of experiences and most of us are stressed out yeah <laughs> Colleen who knew that just by putting your kids ages there that we would get into a deeper conversation about relatedness but we did so I'm so glad you came um, we're going to wrap up here in a minute or so. If you have one last burning question or one thing that you don't want to forget from what you heard today, put it in the chat, put it in the comments, let us know what it is so we can also capture that gem with you. But then it also helps you to walk away with something more clear about like, okay, I'm going to try the relatedness hack by connecting before I correct or is one of them. So I'm gonna review a few. Another is I'm gonna to talk to my now seven-year-old or older, kind of sense their empathy level, and I'm going to be putting that, um, I'm gonna be putting that into, hold on one second. I'm gonna be putting that into action by um, talking about the impact of like what, what could happen if, if we do and if we don't. Also, Joan is asking for the chat link a link to chat with me. And what I did is I put the link to the discovery quiz because there's a way, I sorry, I forgot to mention Joan and for anybody else who's interested. Once you take the quiz at the bottom of it, there is a place where you can apply to meet with me for a session. And um, if none of the dates that are listed there work for you, just say, contact me to schedule a time. It's not coming up, huh? I just put it in the chat. Oh, I know why. I am sending it to all the panelists. 
There you go. Thank you, Joan. You helped me with a tech problem. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't even realize that was happening. There you go. <laughs> um, thank you for that. And oh, so what I wanted to share with you is that because we're in this back to school time, you could put, so put, put your jam up, put your last burning question as you have me for a few more minutes. But as you do that, I wanna let you know that I have um, a public webinar that's gonna be a really special event. That's different from this Monday series. When this Monday series ends, I'm going to be sharing with you ways to rock your routine during back to school time. And it's not the full module of Peter, right? Who, who's taken the full, the full month where we worked on our routines. We outlined them, we worked on them, we got feedback, we put things into place. We got you know, even more feedback and uh, learned like the entire set of strategies. However, I am committed to getting you five key things that you need to know to be able to you know, smooth out your routines and get, get the process started. Um, so we'll get as much done as we can in this hour and a half webinar. So excited to share it with you. Um, and it's on September 11th. I'll put up some information so you can see it. It's on September 11th from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Pacific, which would be 1 to 2.30 Eastern. Um, and this is to really help you. Oh, it's not showing. Hold on a second. Do, do, do. Is this it? How come it didn't show? I'll try it one more time. Let's do it one more time. Um, we're gonna be coming together for that hour and a half and we're gonna be talking through ways that you can, I found it, um, ways that you can you know, really rock your routine so that the kids are more on board with your requests, which is all, there's gonna be motivation hacks built in all the way through. But uh, what I want you to have too are just really key strategies that help you to smooth out your routine, to get your kids more motivated to do it themselves, and also what to avoid. Because there's certain things that we all do when we try to set up a routine that um, when we do it, it can actually set us back. Like the kids will actually want need more reminders. The kids will actually want us to be holding their hand through the whole thing. And I'll be going over that too, so that you can avoid those mistakes and not waste a bunch of your time and energy kind of going down the wrong path was it when it comes to routines. And the reason we're doing it right now is because um, this transition back into school can be a rough ride any year, but then in addition, having all of the you know, COVID related conditions that are different for everybody, um, no, no two routines look the same right now. Everybody's kind of got something different going on. And um, the kids are also going through a bigger transition for some of them. Some of them haven't been to you know, in-person school full time in over a year. And so uh, this is gonna be really important. Uh, so I'm really glad that I have, have the opportunity to share this with you. I'm also gonna put in the chat a link so that you can register. And the reason I'm doing that is because I wanna make sure that you save your spot. It's gonna take me a second here, just grab it. Um, I want you to save your spot in this because the spots are limited. It's a you know, I limit it to a certain number of folks so that we don't end up, um, we end up giving enough personal attention to people. And here is the link to that, that event. I'm putting it both in the Facebook group and on Zoom so everybody has it, okay? Um, so when you click on that link, it'll bring you to a little registration page where um, you can just read a little bit more about it if you'd like before you register. It's a completely, totally free event. So this is a great one too, to share, you know, grab this link and share it with other people in your community. So you can go ahead and just highlight, you know, click it and then highlight the, the link at the top and, you know, share it with folks. Um, and this time I did send, I did put the link to everybody, Joan. Yeah, okay. <laughs> she helped me with that. Thank you again. Um, and then the last thing I want you to know is that uh, I have a handful of workshops that I'm giving away to either free or at low cost to schools. And I'm focusing on preschools and elementary schools. And the school workshop request form I'm sharing with you right now is so great because it only takes two or three minutes to fill out and all it's really easy. All you need to do is just let me know what little bit about the school and your contact information. And what I'll do is I'll kick you um, an email that you can forward to either a PTA president or a PTA person um, or to an administrator at a school and we'll take it from there. And it looks like this. It says school workshop requests. 
Like as you can see, you just fill in your basic information, the name of the school you have in mind, what the kids student ages are and the type of school it is. And these are two topics that I'm gonna be teaching about over the next two months. But then if there's something else you think your school needs right now, you can put other and um, type in an idea there. Anything else you want us to know, just click submit, it's super easy. And we make it super easy because we know that you're busy. Last, last uh, January, this is just about you know eight months ago, we ended up giving school workshops to five different schools in January. And it was so fun, I got to help out hundreds of parents just as we were heading into the new year. And also several of those folks ended up studying with us either in the free Facebook group or as a private client or in the immersion. And we end up with this awesome group of parents that we got to learn with, um, we are learning with all year long. So it's a wonderful way to sort of spread the word if you like what you're learning here and also helping out a bunch of folks um, you know, in a school community. So please don't be shy to request um, and I'll check it out and see if it's a good fit and whether I can offer a free workshop to that school community. Yeah, no reason to wait on that one because we all need the help. <laughs> all over all over the school communities, everyone I'm talking to is sharing with me their struggles right now and I feel you. And I just want you to know, you don't have to do this on your own. I mean, you can, but you don't have to. And that's the really good news. And I think that's part of why people are so excited about um, you know, communities like this one, because, you know, there's this myth out there that just because you can have children, you'll know exactly what to do with them when they arrive. And it's just not true. There's so many things that are not necessarily intuitive that we need to have a little time set aside to think through and some, com some, com some good company there with peers, like the community, like, like this one or another, and then some mentorship, like, why not, you know, how many other jobs or roles in your life do you play that have such a huge job description <laughs> and have such huge outcomes attached to your role but don't offer at least a year of credentialing or training or certification of skills where you're with a mentor where there's an onboarding process there's a manual there's a list of tools and strategies you get to practice you get to ask questions you get to connect with peers who are going through the same thing you know, this kind of cohort based learning thing that we're doing here by gathering as a group and learning together is proven to be like something like 10 to 15 times more effective than self study courses. You know, only something like 7% of people who buy a self study course actually finish it, and even less than that implement what they learn. But the, 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 the cohort based classes like this one, like this free Monday thing, but especially things like the immersion programs, like the year long immersion or a six month coaching intensive with me, they're proven to have 70% or higher, not only completion, but like permanent changes and results. And at least in my world, the percent is much higher. I take, I take families where they, from where they are, I ask them where they want to go and we make permanent changes on the road there. Sometimes for six months, sometimes for a year, sometimes for two or three years, just depending on what their development is and how, how they set their goals if they wanna keep going along the path. And I'm so honored to have this role and to have stumbled upon you know, a community of folks who, parents, big hearted parents who want nothing more than to have an awesome relationship with their kids. So thank you for being a great part of what makes Raising Our Resilience such, an, such a lovely place for uh, parents to land. And hopefully you've learned some things today that have inspired you and also comforted you that there are things you can do to shift things that, you know, shift dynamics that are challenging that aren't quite working. So I snap it up for all of you, send you my love, and we'll be back next week with our final part of the Motivation Hacks series. So you'll want to show up for next Monday at 2 p.m. Otherwise, go ahead and register also for our webinar on September 11th. You'll want to mark, a, mark your calendars and save some time for that. And we'll see you next time. All right, take care, everybody. See you. Let me know, comments, anything else that you want me to know, and I'll make sure to, to get back to you. All right, bye for now. Bye, Peter. Bye, Joan. Bye, Kayla. Bye, Jessica.